Oke. Okay. Oke, okay. uh, I welcome everybody to this uh, first event of the Early Career Scientist Team of the International Association for the Promotion. And uh, uh, I would like to thank you to all the people who are uh, following this uh, this webinar online. Um, this, uh, as I said, is the first event uh, of uh, this uh, group of early career scientists uh, and uh, is made uh, in uh, concomitance with the International of Genetics Day of 2020. The International Genetics Day was a few days ago, but uh, uh, we still uh, uh, organize these uh, events uh, to uh, introduce several topics related to genetics and introduce genetics to people who don't know much about that. We have uh, eight uh, excellent speakers today that will guide us through a nice journey. And after every um, presentation, there will be the opportunity to uh, make some question to the speaker. We will answer one question after each speech, but uh, uh, in the end of all the talks, we will have more time for the discussion. And uh, I invite everybody uh, to write question in the chat so that we can uh, see them in uh, any moment. And you can write your question any moment during uh, the, the speeches, so we can uh, look at them. I will uh, just uh, go to the introduction of the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Giuseppe Di Capua. Giuseppe Di, pa Di Capua is a geologist, a technologist at the National Institute of Geophysics and Vulcanology in Rome, Italy. And his field of expertise is covering engineering, geology, geoethics, and philosophy of geosciences. Is a founding member and treasurer of the International Association for Promoting Geoethics, and he has been actively involved in the European project to deal with geoethics in geosciences. And he will talk about the IAPG, which is an international project. The floor is yours, Giuseppe. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. I share my my, my slides. Okay, greetings to all and uh, thanks to all participants. Uh, my presentation is focused on the International Association for Promoting Geoethics. Uh, I would li uh, like to highlight some activities uh, of the association. I you will find, in any case, more many other information in the IPG website. The IPG is a multidisciplinary platform for widening the discussion and creating awareness about values and problems of ethics applied to the geosciences. The IPG was founded in 2012. It is a scientific, non-governmental, non-political uh, association uh, legally registered as a, a not-for-profit organization officially hosted in Rome at the Italian Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. Our network can count uh, uh, on more than uh, 2,550 members in 129 countries. The bodies of the association are the Executive Council, uh, the General Assembly, the Board of Experts and Delegates, the Early Career Scientist Team, 32 national sections and task groups uh, working on uh, uh, some relevant issues uh, such as responsible mining, uh, geoethics in forensic geology, and recently geo geoethics and geoheritage. Uh, the IPG uh, cooperates uh, with the various international uh, organizations uh, through different types, uh, different waves uh, um, of agreements. We have seven affiliations, 22 agreements for cooperation, and five uh, partnerships. Um, this is uh, the the scheme. Um, uh, this is the scheme of the IPG strategy for promoting geoethics uh, in the period 2019-2022. Uh, our activities follow this scheme. In red, you can see two new initiatives uh, launched in 2019: a school on geoethics and a new series on geoethics by the publisher Spring and Nature. 
the IPG is currently involved uh, at various levels in international projects. It was partner of the European project Goal, the first uh, project entirely dedicated to geoetics, uh, and included the, in the International Advisory Board of the European projects Intermin and ENGIE. Uh, IPG, IPG doesn't receive money from these projects. Moreover, some IPG members are involved in the European project uh, EPOS SP to develop ethical guidelines for this research uh, infrastructure um, focus on a European plate observ observing system. The School on Geoetics and National Issue aims to provide excellent education in geoetics. Its activities and courses are mainly online, all by scientists with expertise in different disciplines and coming from different countries. The school provides online resources such as publication, uh, several videos and interviews on different subjects of interest for uh, geoethics. Uh, regarding publication, there are uh, several ongoing editorial projects. We are close to finish a book in the Lyle collection of the Geological Society of London entitled Geoethics, Status and Future Perspectives. Uh, many chapters are already available as online first in the GSL website. And a new call for a special issue in uh, MDPI on geoethics and sustainability has been uh, recently launched. The, the call for submission is open. As previously said, in 2019, we launched the Springer Brief in Geoethics and we published the, the first book. There is a, another book in preparation that should be ready in the, in the first part of the next year. We are organizing a session entitled Geoethics, Geosciences Serving Society and a course on geoethics at the next uh, EGU General Assembly in Vienna in 2021. Uh, the abstract submission to the session will be open on uh, 20 October, so tomorrow. Uh, from uh, 2017, we celebrate uh, every year the International Geoethics Day and this year the team is uh, Make a Geoethical Promise. And this event, as uh, Jonathan said, uh, is included in the celebration of the International Geoethics Day 2020. Uh, from 2018, the IPG uh, award, uh, awards uh, Geoscientist uh, with the Geoethics Medal. Uh, 2020 medalist is uh, John Geismine, uh, University of Texas at Dallas. And uh, you find uh, the motivation and information about John in the IPG website. And in this webinar, we have also the, our medalist uh, the, in the last year, Linda Gundersen. Uh, this year, we have uh, launched the online questionnaire for an international survey on geoetics. The survey has been partially funded by the IUGS through the annual fund allocation to the IPG. And you are all invited to fill in the questionnaire and to share the link with your colleagues. The survey is open till 31 December 2020. Uh, I have presented only some of the activities of the IPG. You can find detailed information on our website. You will discover that IPG is much more than an organization. It's a global project for contributing to think about our responsibilities towards the Earth system, since we have great duties towards current and future generations and the environment. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe, for this uh, interesting presentation. I remind to the um, to the audience that uh, if someone wants, can do some uh, some question and post uh, into into the chat. I would move now to the to the second presentation, which is made by Christina Toma. She is a geoconservation specialist working for the Geopark program at the University of Bucharest in Romania. Her interest with geotics began in 2016 when she attended the 80th conference on the of the Association of African Women in Geosciences that took place in Sibiu in Romania, where she met Silvia Giuseppe. Uh, Christina, she will talk today about uh, the ECST group of the IAPG. The floor is yours, Christina. 
Hello. I'm very glad to meet you today. And I'm just going to open my presentation. I hope you see the presentation. OK. So I'm Cristina Toma. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself um, in a couple of uh, moments. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the early career scientist team from IAPG. So uh, first things you can see in my presentation is uh, our logo. Uh, in the middle you see the IAPG logo uh, because this is the core of our work. The IAPG is the ground where the early career scientist team has its roots. Um, and our team, you can see the letters uh, ECST is at the base of uh, the stem and wishes, let's say, say to sprout some new and innovative ideas on geoethics um, as seeds for new beginnings. And I don't want to sound too poetic, but we are talking about art uh, since we, uh, we uh, speak about design and the design of the logo, uh, which, by the way, was uh, designed with the help of Flavia Strani who's a PhD in uh, Earth Sciences, um, has a PhD in Earth Sciences from the Department of Earth Sciences in Sapienza University in Rome. Uh, our goal uh, as a team are to promote geoethics and the IAPG in uh, early career and young scientist groups for our clubs, to work as an interface between IAPG and early career and young scientist groups and organizations, and to inspire young or early career geoscientists to take the IAPG mission forward and be able to develop the geoethical thinking based on multi and inter and transdisciplinary view. Our actions so far were getting involved in organizing the Geoethics Day uh, 2020. Uh, and as you saw uh, earlier, as Giuseppe um, showed some photos, with uh, the geoethical promise picture that you saw um, these days on Facebook uh, and actually this webinar. And another um, action so far was to create um, an inside calendar, let's say, for articles uh, for the IAPG blog. Uh, next, I'm going to present you our board, uh, which um, we have this board from 2020 to 2024. Uh, the ECST replaces the Young Scientists Club that was active between 2015 and 2019. And I'm going to start with Daniel de Miguel, who's from Spain and is our spokesperson. And he's a researcher at the Aragonese Foundation for Research and Development and also a collaborator professor at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. Uh, he has a PhD in paleontology and his research is focused on ethical and social implications linked with the paleontological heritage and geoconservation principles, contributing uh, hereby to the geoethical thinking and promotion of awareness rising uh, that may guide the development and future research uh, practices related to paleontology. And also, uh, as an inside thing, uh, he's very eloquent and sends the fastest and best minute, uh, meeting minutes I've seen. And um, our second uh, board member is Ndivo Cecilia Mukosi from South Africa. She's an international and national award-winning geoscientist. He ha she has sorry, a Master of Science in Geology, um, working in multidisciplinary geoethics, um, geoscientific environment, working for the Council of Geoscience in South Africa. She has over 10 years of expertise in SADC countries, uh, with a focus on geological mapping, geological survey, um, um, by this um, strengthening uh, institutional projects. She's a wonderful professional and always has a smile on her face in our meetings. Uh, Sebastian Handel, he's from Austria, is currently working on his PhD, the Institute of Sanitary Engineering and Water Pollution Control. His research concerns drinking water supply in general with a focus on groundwater modeling, as well as emerging pollutants. Um, his interest for geoethics started with the gold project and um, Giuseppe already mentioned something about it and my colleagues will tell you a little bit more about the gold project. Uh, he's always prepared to be of help for any presentation where geoethics and water are involved uh, and he's managing um, some of the various, various issues uh, Teams platform has <laughs> and we face them. Uh, Cesar Oboni, he's from Canada. He's the vice president of Oboni Riscope Associates from Vancouver. 
He has an experience of over 15 years in uh, working with large corporations, government and public sector. He manages risk identification, risk analysis, risk assessment and crisis mitigation projects. He worked in numerous facilities with uh, harbors, coal mining, military and transportation, and he has developed specific experience in the analysis of residual risk of mining water treatment plants and mining infrastructure. He's always very resourceful and professional, even when the kids are running around the house. Uh, Jonathan Rizzi, he's from Italy, but now is based in um, Norway, and uh, he lives in Norway. Um, and is our moderator for today. He has a PhD in environmental sciences, is working since more than 15 years in GIS sector with experience as consultant, lecturer, researcher and project manager of national and international projects in um, countries like China and Ecuador. Uh, his main research activities are concerned with the use of spatial big data and GIS including remote, remote sensing uh, in several environmental sectors, including climate change, forestry, agriculture, contaminated sites and water quality. He's our greatest help uh, hosting our virtual meetings. He's full of ideas and uh, is always uh, very, very efficient. Um, Barbara Zambelli from Brazil. Um, she's a geologist engineer. Uh, she's a speleologist, a science communicator, and environmental activist. She works as an independent consultant and researcher on topics uh, related to cars, but not uh, exclusively, like speleology, hydrology, and geomorphology. Um, she founded, co-founded um, Aponte uh, in 2019, an organization grounded on geoethical principles with the aim of bridging the gap between geosciences and society. And she's one of the most cheerful persons I know and our greatest help with social media and sometimes even design. Alexandra Cardozo is from Portugal. Uh, she has a Master of Science in Biology and Geology teaching with a first degree in geology, uh, with a complementary formation in geology. Uh, she's a researcher at the Institute of Earth Sciences uh, in Porto. She is all, also doing a PhD in science teaching and dissemination with the theme Geoethics in Sustainable Development, Implementation and Evaluation of a Syllabus in Higher Education. She has many useful ideas and is very involved. Cristina Toma is myself. I'm from Romania. I'm currently doing a PhD in geoconservation, uh, more specific in interpretation of geological heritage for tourism um, at the Faculty of Geology and Geophysics, uh, the University of Bucharest. Uh, I'm working since 2019 in the geopark world. I was uh, working and I'm still working for Buzo Land Aspiring Geopark. And since 2019, I'm also working for U Hatseg UNESCO Global Geopark. And since uh, 2018, I'm teaching a course on sustainable development in geoparks um, at the Geoconservation Master from the Faculty of Geology. And as I think you already saw, uh, I like to capture the um, quote <laughs> human part of the scientists. And uh, as I told you who we are, uh, what we want to achieve or what our uh, our goals are, um, I want to know something about you uh, and I invite you to get involved. Um, and contact us if you want to organize an event on geoethics or you need some guidance regarding geoethics, um, if you want to contribute to the geoethics blog. Um, so basically, geoethics means inter, trans and multidisciplinarity. And I advise you to think of ways where geoethics meets your geoscientific work and uh, contact us. <laughs> Maybe we can share some ideas. Uh, you have our email there on the IAPG ECST uh, are, uh, at gmail.com. And um, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And please wish us luck. Thank you, Christina, for this uh, presentation of the team. Uh, we move on to the, to the following presentation. The following presentation is made by uh, Silvia Pepoloni. Silvia Pe Pepoloni is researcher at the Italian Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology, and her scientific activities concern geoadarts and georisks, engineering geology, geoscience communication and education. She is an international leader of geoethics, 
and uh, she is currently Councillor of the International Union of Geological Scientists, Secretary General of the International Association for Promoting Geotics, and Director of the School on Geotics and Natural Issues. Finally, she is also Editor-in-Chief of the Springer Brief in Geotics. So she is a very active uh, woman uh, and a very, uh, I would say, professional uh, scientist. And uh, uh, I would uh, like to leave the floor for an interesting presentation about the foundation of Geotics. The floor is yours, Silvia. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I share my, my screen. OK. Good morning, afternoon or evening, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about Geoethics Foundation and uh, give a reference framework of this emerging field of geosciences so important for our future on the planet. Probably several colleagues in our audience don't know what Geoethics deals with, so in my short speech I will sum up some theoretical concepts uh, and aspects of Geoethics uh, those essential information to frame the main contents of geoethical thinking. I would like to start highlighting that the geoethics is not simply professional ethics. Even if professional ethics is an essential aspect of geoethics, but that's not all. Originally, geoethics was developed in the context of geosciences to increase the awareness of geoscientists on their ethical responsibility and their social and cultural role in society, to society. But over time, geoethics has expanded to define a way in which all the human beings can rethink their relationship with the Earth system in the light of principles and values that can provide a an healthy and safe life in the respect for geo-ecosystems. Well, let's start by fixing two important points. The first is, why do we need geoethics? Human actions have a profound impact on social ecological systems that are complex sets of closely interconnected natural and anthropic elements. So, which are the best way to manage the interaction between humans and those delicate systems. Second point, geosciences are an indispensable support for society to identify effective strategies and solutions to current global environmental problems and economic sustainability. So, which are the best ways geosciences can contribute to help society and to assure a sustainable development to human communities. This is the ambit in which we are moving and decisions have, we have to take need understanding of the problems to be faced, knowledge of the tools we have in our hands to try to solve those problems, awareness of our role as geoscientists and responsibility of the consequences of our actions. So understand which are the right or at least acceptable solutions and decisions to improve our interaction with the planet is an issue of utmost urgency for geoethics. Let's start from the definition of geoethics that is fundamental to understand the aim, the subject, and the perimeter of the geoetics field. Sorry, but my presentation stops to, to work. I don't know why. I try again, just a moment. Okay. Let's start from the definition of geoethics. Geoethics consists of research and reflection on the values which underpin appropriate behaviors and practices wherever human activities interact with the Earth system. This part of the definition 
clearly expresses the subject, the aim and the function of geoethics. The identification of those values capable to guide humans towards appropriate behaviors and practices in relation to the earth. The second part of geoethics definition. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, I'm sorry, Silvia, we cannot see the presentation. OK, I try to to go just a moment. Thank you. <clears throat> Now it is perfect. It's perfect. OK, thank you. OK, um, so this part of the definition clearly expresses the subject, the aim and the function of geoethics, the identification of those values capable to guide humans towards appropriate behaviors and practices in relation to the Earth. The second part of the geoethics definition states that geoethics deals with the ethical, social and cultural implications of geoscience knowledge, education, research, practice and communication, providing a point of intersection for geosciences, sociology, philosophy and economics. This sentence indicates the focus and the approach of the geoethical studies, highlighting the centrality of geoscience in development developing a geoethical thinking, but at the same time pointing out that inputs coming from other disciplines are essential to define the values of geoethics and underlining that the geoethical subject is a multifaceted subject, a meeting point of several areas of knowledge which must cooperate in a multidisciplinary way and integrate effectively. So the definition of geoethics out outlines the perimeter of the geoethical analysis and action, highlighting the need to preliminarily identify the values, those common values on which to base human choices affecting the planet, considering geoscience as the indispensable set of disciplines to shape responsibly and sustainably the human earth system relationship. Starting from the definition, let's go more in depth in the wide framework of contents proposed by geoethics. Geoethics is definable as an ethics of the human agent towards the earth, where the earth is to be intended, intended as a complex system consisting of biotic and abiotic elements, but also technological and cultural ones. Geoethics propose a philosophical reflection and a practice, both individual and social, potentially extendable to society as a whole, while respecting and implementing the contribution of all people on the earth with different knowledge, experiences and perspectives to solve global problems. This is why geoethics is inclusive. But diversity needs to be managed into a common ethical framework capable of assuring a reasonable alignment of values capable of going beyond the interest of single individuals or communities and their conflicting expectations, capable of placing itself along a common human horizon of sharing. A distinctive feature of geoethics is that it is centered on the human agent, placed in the middle of an ethical reference system in which individual, social and environmental values coexist and support personal responsibilities. Responsibilities articulate according to different levels of interaction or domains of the human experience, 
that become gradually wider, more complex and intricate. And these domains are the self, the social groups to which individuals belong, including professional ones, society and future generations, and the environment. The geoethical reference values are applied within these four existential and interactive domains. In the geoethical vision, the human agent moves within these domains and from time to time acts consciously according to an analytic and prudent approach based on the principle of responsibility. But a responsible choice has to have freedom as its fundamental principle. Without freedom, it's not possible to act ethically. Being in a condition of, pre of freedom allows one acting by one's own conscious and well-pondered choice, rather than under pressure, with all the possible negative consequences that may derive. Geoethics is therefore characterized as an ethic of virtue, in which the human agent consciously adheres to a framework of reference values centered on honesty, awareness, integrity, transparency, reliability, competence, and follows virtuous behavior based on care, coherence, prudence, wisdom, dialogue, and good sense. Such behaviors contribute along with those of other individuals to establish a human health system relationship that is founded on the recognition of the dignity of all the elements that make up, make up the social ecological system. Each of us as human agent acts within a participative process aimed at solving issues starting from scientific knowledge of the planet informed by human experience. Geoethics puts in the foreground the individual responsible action based on the adoption of professional and social reference values. Its development and application take place within a pragmatic, open and continuous process of reviewing choices, supported by the work of scientists aware of their social role at the service of society. Behaviors inspired by geoethics are the result of scientifically based choices. Choices in line with the geoethical vision should take into account the variety of human cultures and social conditions that characterize each context globally, as well as they cannot ignore the physical, chemical, biological peculiarities of the territories that will be involved in the anthropic interventions. These choices must therefore be contextualized in space and time. Any analytical and critical approach to solve problems has to be based on equity to guarantee the same opportunities for social, economic and cultural development to the various human groups and to future generations. And it has to be aimed at building a more just society in a natural environment that is not degraded, even in cultural and aesthetic terms. This, the definition of prescriptive behaviors and rules that underestimate the importance of the context in which they must be applied could trigger opposite effects, inducing antagonistic tensions and a priori rejections by the population. So the geoethical approach takes into account the space-time complexity of existing physical and social realities, identifying their technical, environmental, economic, cultural and political limits. In the awareness that similar problems 
may require different solutions in different contexts. So, concepts such as prevention, diversity, sustainability, adaptation, protection of the territory, geo-environmental education, conservation of nature, etc., that have a clear social dimension become reference values for the geoethical action. To conclude, a few hints about recent developments of the geoethical thinking. From the geoethical perspective, the ongoing environmental crisis can prove to be a great opportunity for an authentic cultural change and development of wisdom. To be lived without fear, guided by science, and illuminated by our authenticity of human beings. But this will be possible only on condition that each of us, according to his or her personal abilities and possibilities, operates in an ethical framework in which the duty to ensure rights comes first to the right to demand duties. And this is the concept developed and pointed out in our recent proposal for a responsible human development charter. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Silvia, for your interesting presentation. Uh, a reminder to the audience that uh, a question can be posted in the chat. Uh, to more generic questions, we will answer in the end. But I can already anticipate that uh, uh, we will we are recording this webinar, and in the end uh, we can uh, people will be able to to look it again after the the event. I'm moving now to the following presentation, who is uh, held by Alexandra Cardoso. Alexandra is a PhD student at the Faculty of Sciences of the University of Porto. Her thesis is about uh, bringing geotics and sustainable development to our education curriculum. She's here to talk about genetics in education and an example of case-based teaching. So the floor is yours, Alexandra. Hello, thank you. I am sharing my screen, my presentation. Okay. Okay. So, hello, I'm Alexandra, and I want to thank you all for being here. Today I'm here to talk about the so needed geoethics education and about the case-based teaching educational resource, an outcome of geoethics outcomes and awareness learning project, uh, an Erasmus Plus project. Uh, first of all, I want to explain a concept concerning the planet we inhabit, the Earth system concept. As such, we know that Earth functions as a holistic system with five interconnected subsystems. Humans are included in the biosphere and we know that uh, one action made on one subsystem has impacts on all the others. Thus, we must see our planet always as uh, one single system. I want to uh, emphasize that knowing how the planet works is the basis for all geoscientific knowledge and it is essential for the resolution of the great challenges that humankind faces every day. So talking a little bit about geoethics, uh, we must recognize that uh, interconnect geosciences, philosophy, sociology and economics. Uh, geoethics is a scientific discipline in development whose primary concern is to instill a better relationship between the citizens and the planet they inhabit. Uh, also, with the multiplicity of ethical, social and cultural values, the significant input geoethics can have on decision making worldwide is recognized. Geoethics in education uh, is more scarce than it should be, considering the great challenges that society faces. Uh, actually, geoethics is a thematic that has been arising over the last decade, but mainly on scientific community. However, 
geoethical thinking and knowledge are absent uh, among the broader public. Therefore, geoethics is not a subject considering in daily life decisions of most citizens, and it's actually essential for taking better decisions when interacting with our planet. Uh, this thing creates a great need to educate and raise awareness among citizens about geoethics, especially the future geoscientists. Uh, the later have a straight relationship with the Earth on their daily professional lives. As such, geoethics is vital for the exercise of their profession. I think, and I hope you all agree with me, that uh, education is the best way to change future decisions, and in this case, also to bring geoethics at the center of discussion. Uh, geoethics education is of utmost importance and urgent for the dissemination and practice of geoethics worldwide. Uh, in this light, some studies show us that higher education students and teachers never heard about geoethics. The same does not happen for bioethics or environmental ethics, for example. However, after clarified about uh, geoethics, both recognize its importance and relevance and are in favor of including geoethics on higher educational curriculum. Therefore, and taking into account that geoethics concerns much about geoscientists, higher education geoscience curriculum should be the first to include the scientific field. Now talking a little bit about the GOAL project. Uh, GOAL project or Geoethics Outcomes and Awareness Learning was the first Erasmus Plus project concerning geoethics, namely geoethics in education. The GOAL project had as the main aim to develop a geoethical syllabus for higher education curricula. The project involved institutions from six six sorry six countries and the coordinator was the university of porto in portugal the it engaged specialists from diverse areas from geoethics to a geo heritage or management of geological resources and water the main outcomes of the project were one ebook named teaching geoethics 11 educational resources about several geoethical aspects, issues and dilemmas to implement on higher education courses, and one syllabus for geoethics in higher education. All the outcomes are freely available on Goal website, which will be posted on the webinar chat, but is also available on this PowerPoint. Uh, now, I will give you an example of uh, case-based teaching in mining using one of GOAL's educational resources called Can we dare modern society does not... Can we dare say modern society does not need mineral raw materials? The aim of this resource is to promote a reflection about the increasing demand of minerals from developing countries and upon transparent dissemination of information by all actors directly involved in mining. This educational resource is based on the case of lithium exploration on one of the great deposits Portugal has in Covas do Barroso in the Barroso Alvão region. Uh, we must know that lithium is a critical element and it has diverse applications, namely on green technologies. It presents a great and environment, uh, economic and environmental importance for today's society and for the planet. In this educational resource, uh, students are confronted with two scenarios that give them the context to think about geoethical issues in mining. The first scenario presents the lithium characteristics and the conflicting case of Covas do Barroso. The second one presents a report about the case of Covas do Barroso concerning the communication between the different actors involved on the lithium mining with highlights 
from the social point of view. This report shows us how bad communication strategies can result on the opposition of most of local citizens in relation to the mining process. In this case, students must think about several issues concerning the case previously presented. They have to think about the consequences of untransparent communication between all actors, good or bad information quality given by the mass media to society, ways to mitigate negative impacts from mining process, a plan of rehabilitation based on environmental and social sustainable standard elements and management systems, and the absolute dependence of modern society concerning mineral resources. Uh, for solving these issues, students have to resort to the white paper of responsible mining, which concerns practices and applicable guidelines for a geoethical mining process. According to this vital document, responsible mining demonstrably respects and protects the interests of all stakeholders, human health and the environment and contributes discernibly and fairly to broad economic development of producing country and to benefit local communities while embracing best international practice and upholding the rule of law. Also, it highlights that mineral resources are needed for the development of society, namely for the decarbonization process. And because of this, geoethical challenges take place when deciding about a possible mining. The practices and applicable guidelines for a geoethical mining process proposed on the referred document include, among others, the need for the involvement and engagement of all stakeholders to make a balance between positive and negative consequences of mining, taking into account geoethical values, ensuring the protection of the environment and the people, cooperation between all actors to understand and protect the biodiversity of the mining local, recognizing that mining can be not a desirable outcome, planning all the mining process from exploitation to the rehabilit from sorry from exploration to the rehabilitation phases and promoting a transparent and reliable communication concerning all the mining process between all actors involved after the implementation of the referred educational resources students have to reach several objectives concerning Situations that put face-to-face -face mineral exploitations versus no mineral exploitations. The need for mineral resources for society's daily products and activities. The increasing demand of modern society for mineral resources. The need to include geoethics and its ethical, social and cultural values in the mining process. The role of geoscientists to mediate the conflicts between stakeholders and the broader society. The need for transparent and reliable information exchange between all actors involved in the mining process. How to ensure minimal negative impacts on environmental, social and economics. And finally, how to deal with geoethical dilemmas that arise from the mining industry. Thank you for your attention. Now I'm available to answer any possible questions concerning my presentation. Thank you, Alexandra. We are uh, uh, waiting a moment for some question, but if not, we will have more time for a question in the end of the of the webinar. Okay. And uh, we will move now to the following presentation. The following presentation is held by Daniel de Miguel. Daniel de Miguel uh, has a degree in geology and, is and a PhD in paleontology. He is a permanent researcher, the researcher of the Aragonese Foundation for Research and Development, ARAID, at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. He develops his works on several fields of vertebrate paleontology and ethical and social implications linked with the paleontological heritage and geoconservation principle. The floor is yours, uh, um, Daniela.
Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? No, we cannot see the. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for uh, being here uh, with us in this uh, geoethics uh, webinar. The following presentation is about how the paleontological heritage uh, frames within uh, geoethics. As this link uh, may result uh, apparently not evident, but is clear when it's uh, further uh, inspected. Okay. Okay. Uh, to do so, I think that it's mandatory to start by making emphasis on the fact that the uh, geosciences have experimented in the last years the need to come on geoscientists with an ethical attitude and values to underpin appropriate uh, behaviors with our planet. This can be one of the uh, many possible definitions on geoethics, for which its foundation, as Sylvia said, uh, is trace it back into three main pillars. The importance of the geological culture, the concept of both social and individual uh, responsibility, and the definition of an ethical criterion on which to guide behavior in geosciences. But the question here is, how the paleontological heritage does frame within uh, geoethics? To answer that question, I think that we need first a short background, but crucial, on fossils and paleontology. Uh, fossils are any evidence of one living organisms from past ages that are preserved in the materials of the lithosphere. They represent a relevant component of the geodiversity and have the unusual potential to connect people with our natural environment and also, and importantly, with our past and origins. So it's worth in, nothing to stress that there is an unusual and inherent capacity of the fossils to attract uh, attention of people and, of course, create vocation for science. In all probability, this is in part because of the growing inclusion of many extinct species in the movies in the last years, especially, as we all know, dinosaurs in the Jurassic Park uh, movies. And fortunately, we can use uh, this capacity for transmitting knowledge to geoscientists, including uh, educators, the authorities, and also the society in general. The reason for such uh, capacity to attract uh, interest is because the paleontological heritage is strongly associated first with our uh, natural, uh, social, and cultural values, and cannot be understood without this uh, synergetic uh, perspective. So there are many and many aspects related with this heritage that may lead to a lot of ethical conflicts. For example, first, public works, mining activities, or engineering projects which can destroy sites, fossil sites, of relevant importance to the paleontology. The second, uh, is related with individual actions to collect the most spectacular and relevant fossils related to commercial and collecting or even vandalism. And the third is the dramatic increase in the use of the fossils in research, education, and in touristic activities and exhibitions as well in the last years. So I'm going now to present very briefly a few of these uh, examples in the following slides with the aim to provide you an overview of the main uh, dilemmas and conflicts affecting the paleontological uh, heritage. So first, there are infrastructure related works that allow for the discovery of new fossils and that raise the need for a proper balance between the development of these public works, of course, but as well for the preservation of the new uh, 
heritage. This is much more usual than expected, and it was, for example, the case of Loueco fossil site in Spain, in Cuenca, for which an amazing late Cretaceous uh, site uh, yielded a new and unusual unexpected concentration of uh, dinosaurs in 2007 as a result of a um, railroad project. It constitutes a real case study and you can follow it in the website of the GOAL project showing how to manage a geoethical conflict with benefits either for the administration, the society and the scientific community as well. Another similar dilemma occurs when mining activities play a role for the discovery of new fossil sites. In these cases, of course, we need the resources, but protection and geoconservation conservation of the fossils and the sites from the loss and destruction is also needed. The late Miocene sites of Cerro de los Batallones in Spain as well, in Madrid, were discovered accidentally in 1991 by mining works looking for cellulite and they constitute today some of the most relevant fossil communities worldwide, particularly with regard to the evolution, the taxonomy and the systematics of saber-tooth cat. So in recent years, the popularity of fossils as collecting and commercial objects, as you can see here in the slide, uh, has significantly increased, in all probability because they have a high and very high, in some instance, economic value. For example, there is a red sand, totally crazy for me, example of this, which contains the T-Rex fossil found by an amateur paleontologist sold an action only two or three weeks ago for $32 million. So there are also a number of geoethical problems emerging from the concept of fossil economy. A first one is that the appropriation and trade of fossils is illegal in many countries. Apart from the obvious problem that the massive digs for commercial use of the fossils is leading to the destruction of the sites and new specimens, another consequence as we can see here is the proliferation of fakes, like for example the trilobites from Morocco, which consist of fabric fabricating new specimens from very disparate parts. Of course, this has a very obvious negative impact on both the science and society, because many of this unreal material is difficult to identify as such, even to the experts, and is uh, published in research, in journals, and exhibited in the museums as new. Finally, the case of Amber from uh, Myanmar, uh, fossil locality in, in Asia is even more serious because there are very away uh, some fossils that have emerged in uh, mines of amber in where the army and the local uh, independence army fight for the control. So as a result, paleontologists are here confronted with um, ethical concerns with regard to buy or not to buy the fossils. But the situation is really tricky, as the amber is sold even if scientists don't use fossils in research, which is ultimately and unfortunately funding local war and violence. So finally, to conclude, the main message that I want to make uh, emerge from this presentation is that the paleontological heritage overlap perfectly with the three main pillars of geoethics as it remarks the importance of the geological culture, it increases the concept of social and individual responsibility, and also it promotes the ethical criterion on which to guide behavior in, in the sciences. So this is how and why the paleontological heritage trends with geoethics. But, and I will say more, it's evident that uh, paleontology and also the uh, Geoheritage has proven to be a very effective tool for all of us to think critically about natural, sociocultural, and economic issues. So I think it plays a role to raise uh, citizens' awareness of geoethics in a very easy, nice, and very funny way as well. 
So together we can make use of this for promoting geoethics, especially among the young people. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Daniel, for uh, the interesting presentation. Uh, I see that uh, we receive a question a bit after we conclude the presentation and I'm saying this for the audience because uh, we have a delay between when we speak and when you see the video. So uh, probably we are not able to answer immediately to the question but we are receiving them and we are going to answer as soon as uh, uh, we complete the, the presentation and we will have a general discussion. We will have the possibility also to share the, the presentation and the video, as I said, is being recorded and will be shared. If you have a specific question, you can contact us and I will share all the contacts and will be put on screen later when there will be no more presentations. Uh, we are moving now to the following presentation which uh, uh, is uh, held by Sebastian Handel. Uh, we spoke a lot about uh, soil uh, geology, but uh, now we move to a different environment. We move to water and to the aspect of geoethics in water management. management. Uh, Sebastian is currently a PhD student in, at the Institute of Sanitary Engineering and Water Pollution Control at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria. His research concerns drinking water supply in general with a focus as well as emerging pollutants. Geoethics started to become an area of interest for Sebastian during his involvement in the Gold Project that we have already heard, uh, and he was dealing on topics such as geoethics in water supply management and ethical challenges connecting to energy production from hydropower. The floor is yours, Sebastian. Yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> I also want to share my screen here, sorry. So, sorry for the difficulty. So, So I hope everyone can see my screen now. Uh, we, do. Oh. we do, Sebastian. Say again? We do see your screen. It's OK, okay. Thank you. okay so uh, I want to send out a warm service from uh, Vienna. And uh, I want to thank you for taking the time and listening to our presentations. Uh, I will talk in my uh, speech here about the aspect, some aspects of geoethics in water management. What, uh, what are we going to cover here is, uh, first I want to speak about what is a human right and the access to water. Then there will be a, a part about the water as a trigger of conflicts in the world. Further, we go on with further challenges that uh, will arise on the world scale. Then uh, we cover the topic of virtual water and water footprint and move on after that to some aspects of the sustainable development goals uh, collect, uh, in relation to uh, dam dams and uh, uh, hydropower plants. And in the end, we will from all of this conclude why geoethics makes sense in all of this. So, coming to the uh, topic of access to water, in 2010, the UN recognized the human rights to water and sanitation. So, everyone has the right to sufficient, continuous, safe, accept acceptable, physical, accessible, and affordable water for personal and domestic use. Sorry, Sebastian, we are yes. not seeing your presentation. You have to put it in presentation mode. Okay. OK, now. Can you see it? Yes, it's not on presentation mode, but we can see it. OK. So just to make sure, are we? Are you seeing a diagram now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Um, so to support uh, public health interests, water must be safe, so its quality must be good and it must really readily be available. Contaminated water can transmit disease such as DRA, uh, cho cholera, dysentery, typhoid and polio. In that equipment, uh, management of urban, industrial and agricultural wastewater leads to pollution uh, and of drinking water. Um, this is the data from the World uh, Health Organization from 2019. So about 70% of the world's population has uh, safe managed uh, drinking water and access to that. About uh, 18 or 90% have access to basic services. This means that uh, it's improved water source and it's in less than 30 minutes distance from the user. But we still have about 11% uh, of the population in the world that don't, don't have even basic uh, access to basic services. Uh, the, in this, um, these are about uh, Seven, uh, 800 million people and they either have limited services so their the resource is more than 30 minutes in this uh, distance to the user or um, the water comes from unprotected wells and springs and also 144 million uh, people still rely on untreated surface water like from lakes, ponds, rivers, or streams. Now we come to the topic of conflicts connected to the water. Uh, the Pacific Institute has a database for conflicts related to water and they categorize them in three uh, groups. So uh, in the trigger group, there is water as a trigger or the root cause that causes a conflict where there is a dispute over the control of water or water systems, or where e economic and physical access to water or scarcity of water triggers violence. The second group is the group where water is used as a weapon in conflicts, where water resources or water systems themselves are used as a tool or weapon in a violent conflict. And as a category, Sorry yes. to interrupt you again. We cannot see the slides we you are talking about. We are still in the chart. Okay. Does okay. It, did it change now? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I Sebastian, just I, this uh, I suggested to use just the the normal screen and not the presentation yes, mode. I, I will stay with this and I hope these technical okay. issues will then Okay, now it seems fine. Thank the you. third group is the casualty group where water resources or water systems is a casualty of conflict. Uh, water resources or water systems are in intentional or incidental casualties or targets of violence. I took the data from the years to, uh, 1980 until now and we can see that uh, for all these uh, conflicts in the group, uh, we found that about 75% uh, uh, in this of these cases, there were um, water was uh, a casualty, but up to 35% water was the trigger of conflicts, and in 13% there were water was a weapon in the, in the conflict. And if you see the time series of this data. Uh, where we have uh, the number of conflicts uh, along the time, we can see that there is for sure there will be there is some issue with uh, reported conflicts in the past, but still we can see a, a strong increase of cases, and this will also very probable uh, go on in the future. But what are the further challenges on uh, on a world scale? So on the one hand, we also have uh, climate change, which uh, will increase the uncertainty and the uh, and the extreme events. Then we have increased water scarcity 
the population will grow, there will be demographic changes and the urbanization also comes into play. By 2025, half of the world's population will live in a water stressed area. Climate change will lead to, the, to greater fluctuations in harvested rainwater and management of all water resources will need to be improved to ensure provision and quality. Now we come to the topic of virtual water and the water footprint. The, the water we consume during the day makes up just 3% of the actual water that we consume because 97% uh, of the water we consume is incorporated in the products that we uh, use. The, we can uh, divide the water that we use in green water, blue water or grey water. Green water is the rainwater that is incorporated in, in products that we use. Blue water is the water that was taken from surface or groundwater and is incorporated in the products. And grey water is the water that is needed to assimilate certain pollutants that were uh, released to the to the environment during the production of the goods we use. So the daily consumption of water, the direct consumption is about 140 liters per person and here in red and we can see that uh, a glass of wine, a cup of coffee or a glass of beer uh, nearly cover that amount. But if we go further we can see that cheese, 100 grams of cheese, chicken or ham have a multiple of the of the water that we that we uh, use every day at home, and the smartphone already has seven times the the water that we use during a day incorporated. But if we move move further and we see that uh, 100 grams of beef uh, already incorporate one, more than 1,500 liters of water, and similar for chocolate and a pair of jeans. Uh, uses seven, uh, 57 times the amount of water that we use during our daily consumption. What can be considered a modern eth ethical guidance? I would say the sustainable development goals might be seen as such a thing. We now want to see how the these are related to uh, artificial reservoirs or energy production from hydropower. Both of these have, uh, can uh, support agriculture by irrigation, for instance, for the artificial reservoirs, constant drinking water supply for, for the users around, or also hydropower. And the energy production from hydropower helps to uh, generate sustainable energy. We can connect this to, to, the, to the sustainable development goals and see that uh, we have zero hunger uh, related to artificial reservoirs and, and it helps to irrigate and uh, uh, help the agriculture. Then we have the clean water and sanitation, which will support it, but can be supported by artificial reservoirs. Also, affordable and clean energy is covered by that and sustainable cities and the communities is one of the goals that is supported by, art, might be supported by artificial reservoirs. And energy production from hydropower, besides all of that, also uh, helps, the uh, helps the goal of climate action. But on the other hand, we also have the life uh, below water and life on land because uh, uh, both the artificial reservoirs as well as uh, energy production from hydropower have very strong in influence on the riverine ecosystems and biodiversity due to flow alterations, hydro peaking and uh, changes in river connect connectivity and habitat fragmentation. The, the wildlife in, in these uh, ecosystems is uh, highly disturbed. So why geoethics? The challenges are wide. 
We have, uh, we have to provide safe and accessible drinking water for all. We have to help to prevent conflicts over water. The uncertainties and dynamics of uh, climate change will increase and global markets and the uh, virtual water connect the whole world. So professionals with a high education in geoscience should be, they will be at the heart to solve all these problems in the future. They will be engineers, scientists, consultants and advisors and also the people affected. They will face um, issues and dilemmas during their whole work life and they should get also prof professional training on how to deal with these conflicts. Geoethics provides the theoretical background on these challenges with the four levels of responsibility like uh, Silvia already talked about, the understanding of the difference between issues and dilemmas and uh, they also give a framework for ethical, cultural and social values. And with this, I, I thank you and uh, hope to uh, answer your questions in the end. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we have uh, uh, some questions, but uh, given the time, we will reply to the question in the end of the of the webinar, and we move to the to the following presentation. The following presentation is held by Cesar Boni. Cesar is the vice president of Boni Riscopa Associate in Vancouver, Canada. He has an exceptional combination of technical expertise and deep understanding of cross-cultural environments. He developed this skill over 15 years of experience while working for large corporations, governments and public sector organizations in Europe, North America and Japan. His presentation is about misleading and fuzzy risk assessment clash with geotics principle and in their public acceptance. The floor is yours, Cesar. So uh, since we're all been confined uh, for a while now, uh, let's go on a sightseeing trip to a remote place of the world, uh, the land of the midnight sun, which is <laughs> actually really dark right now. So let me, yeah, there we go. Misleading and fuzzy risk assessment clash with geoetic principle and hinder public acceptance. Over 15, over for 50 years, Giant Mine produced 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide, which was buried in man made underground chambers in the permafrost. Arsenic arsenic trioxide is stable and will remain there forever un unless it washes out. As a result of climate change, the permafrost is thawing and the chambers are becoming unstable and leaking into the Great Slave Lakes. So over 15 years ago, we were asked to be on the Mackenzie Valley Environmental Impact Review Board for the Environmental Rehabilitation. The board mission is to conduct a fair and timely environmental impact assessment in the Mackenzie Valley that protects the environment, including the social, economic and cultural well-being of its residents. For those that are wondering, the total size of the Mackenzie Basin is more than one third of that of the Amazon. It also has a lot of First Nations land and uh, is quite important here in Canada. So, Pardon me. The risk assessment produced by the developer did not match what the board wanted, as they deemed it's not enough to protect the environment, including the social, economic, and cultural well being of the residents. This was the matrix the proponents use in their risk assessments. So I'm going to leave this slide for. 10 seconds and let you think about if you can see and spot the problems of this matrix. So, first of all, it was 
arbitrary in the sense that it was performed with no consultation of the First Nations or any other impacted people. Then it was arbitrary in the color of the matrix. It doesn't match any published and accepted thresholds. Then it was arbitrary in the split of, of the values. The consequences was also to choose the worst and did not look at the additive function of the risks. And finally, there was a gap in the likelihood scale leading to even more arbitrary selections. So the board stated that a rational and societal acceptable risk assessment should include a proper glossary containing a description of the term used in the project, a definition of the project context, a properly defined hazard and risk register, a clearly defined system of macro and sub elements, and a unified metric showing consequences as a function of all health and safety, environmental, economic and financial direct and in indirect effects. The consequences must include ranges, that includes uncertainties, and when evaluating the consequences, the risk assessment needs to explicitly define risk acceptability threshold in consultation with potential affected communities. This is very important. Also, risk and tolerance must be developed separately in such a way as to not influence or bias the judgment of the assessor. All those points are compliant with, with the Ashukan Declaration of April 2017 and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. It was only after those steps would be enacted that the board would be able to determine if the project protects the environment, including the social, economic, and cultural well-being of residents. Thus, if it's compliance with geoethics. Misleading and fuzzy risk assessment indeed clash with geoethic principle and hinder public acceptance. Conflict of interest must be avoided. No designer proponent should ever prepare a risk assessment on their own project. We need risk assessment methodology that foster communication and are focused on seeking consensus. And health discussion of mitigation will then ensure projects are safer and more resilient, fulfilling a cr crucial social need. If you want to know more about the giant mine environmental rehabilitation, the whole project and transcribed discussion are on a publicly available repository. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cesar, for this uh, very nice presentation and uh, very nice images I have to say being in Norway. <laughs> um, we move now to the following presentation, which is the last one before the short uh, final discussion. And the following speaker is Linda Gundersen. Linda Gundersen, sorry, I have to change the presentation. Okay. Uh, Linda Gundersen is scientist emeritus at the USGS with the 34 year. Uh, uh, as research experience as research scientist, program manager, and senior executive B, executive before retiring in 2013. Her early career, she conducted and managed research projects in geochemistry, ore deposits, and radionuclides in rocks, soil, and water, eventually assessing the geologic radon potential of the USA. In 1998, she became Associate Chief Geologist for Operation, and in 2001, she became the Chief Scientist for, Geologist, for Geology. And she has been overseeing projects in many different uh, topics, including also global climate change, energy and mineral resources, and more. In 2010, she became the first Director of the Office of Science Quality and Integrity, establishing scientific integrity, ethics, education, research excellence, and other programs across USGS. 
I would say she is a, a very pioneer in the fields of genetics, and uh, that is the reason why also in 2019, last year, she has been awarded with the genetics medal. And uh, today she will give a presentation about the many, the many dimension of the science professionalism. The floor is yours, Linda. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to be talking about the many dimensions of geoscience professionalism today. So geoscience professionalism is basically your job. It's providing sound geoscience knowledge and application of theory, good judgment and services and opinions only in your area of expertise. It requires exceptional ethics, including geoethics, research integrity, business ethics, publication ethics, personal ethics. Now, codes of conducts, um, professional societies, professional standards, and ethics policies have been put into place to help support geoscience professionalism. But it's you, you the geoscientist, who makes all of the difference. So I want you to imagine yourself um, as a geoscience professional, uh, looking at your sphere of influence. You have responsibilities to the individual, the interpersonal, the societal, and the environmental ethical domains. And I've broken them down into your coworkers, students or people you mentor, your employer, society, science, and the earth. Hi, Linda. Oh, so it jumped ahead. Linda. <laughs> yes? You'll need to share your slides just real quick. Oh, OK. Hold on. Yep. I thought I was sharing them. Didn't go. Right? But you so can hear me. Yes? We can hear you, but back in your Teams application, use the share button to share your slides. All right, I'm going to go back there. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, it has me. So there's the share content. Yep, go ahead and click on that. And uh, I had clicked on that. And it's and showing that I am. There we go. Do you have it? It will come up in just a moment. We're in the presenter view, so we can see your slides. We're not in presentation view, but presenter. Yep, I can go into presentation. Can you see it? Perfect. OK, so I'm just going to describe this very briefly because actually this my talk is less than 10 minutes. Um, I want you to imagine yourself as a geoscience professional and you're surrounded um, by these different dimensions that you have ethical responsibilities to your coworkers, students, your employee, society, science, and the earth. So let's talk first about our responsibility to ourselves though. We have a responsibility to represent ourselves honestly, to have no conflict of interest, to have the knowledge to do the job, to continuously improve and learn, to especially acknowledge our limitations and make sure our intentions are honest and clear to others and to ourselves. We understand, we need to understand our moral and ethical choices and our responsibility towards many of the things that you've been hearing today, safety, saving lives, future generations, and stewardship of the earth. We need to uphold professional codes of ethics to honestly earn those proper degrees, certifications, and licenses needed for the job and support the setting of professional standards. Um, we also need to take care of and respect ourselves. Our responsibility to our coworkers. We need to be honest, respectful, transparent, treat everyone equally and fairly, practice inclusivity. If someone in the room is being silent, ask them their opinion, ask them their ideas. Those ideas could be critical. 
share data and knowledge, respect intellectual property, and provide constructive peer review. We also have to protect each other from bullying and harassment. So our responsibility to our students or people that we're mentoring is the same as the responsibility to our coworkers with some additions that we nurture, mentor, and provide opportunities and support to our students and the people we're mentoring, that we teach them excellence and we teach them the scientific method, really um, excellence in geoscience, research integrity in geoethics, that we equip them, that, that we really equip them to meet the challenges. Our responsibility to our employer is honesty in all things, to behave professionally, being reliable and trustworthy, doing the best geoscience. And that includes that lifelong learner thing and using the scientific method, but always verify your data sources, understand your probabilities and uncertainties and let them be known adhere to regulations, laws, and best practices, protect confidential information, and never misuse our knowledge of geoscience. So I'm taking a piece from the geoethical promise and talking about our responsibility to society. I will practice geosciences being fully aware of the societal implications, and I will do my best for the protection of the Earth system for the benefit of humankind. So that means we're conducting science in the best interest of society and the Earth. We're protecting society from geohazards. We're innovating to provide responsible and sustainable extraction and use of Earth resources. We're making sensitive and critical science available rapidly for decision making. We're communicating appropriately with the public and we're contributing to sound policy. And finally, our and, um, I just have two more, our responsibility to science. Um, this is an area that um, research integrity that I have worked quite a bit in, and I really appreciate the National Academy of Sciences five core values in research integrity. They include objectivity, honesty, openness, accountability, fairness, and stewardship. Adhere to that scientific method. Foster progress in the geosciences. Be that lifelong learner. Verify your data sources. Understand and make clear probabilities and uncertainties. Publish and make available all interpretation, methodology, and data in a timely, accessible manner. Follow publication ethics and participate in professional activities in support of science, society, and geoethics. And finally, our responsibility to the earth. Conduct excellent geoscience that leads to good stewardship of earth resources, sustainable development, conservation, protection and improvement of the health of the environment, and benefits to society minimize negative impacts to the environment and society in all the work that you do. And please engage professionally in geoethical issues, as well as speak at, write for, and support geoethical events. These are some of the references that I used in this presentation. And I know there's redundancies in each of those domains, but that's a good thing. We need to reinforce our ethical values and everything that we do in, in whoever we're interacting with uh, for the benefit of society and the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for this inspiring presentation. I see already some people uh, uh, thanking you for, uh, your, uh, for your presentation and mentioning uh, the responsibility of students and not only so I think the audience is appreciating this, uh, this presentation. Uh, we have finished with the presentation, I would say. Uh, we are moving soon to the, to the question and answer session. 
but uh, you see uh, that we were two moderators and I will leave soon the floor to Barbara Zambelli. Barbara Zambelli is a Brazilian geologist engineer, a speleologist and science communicator and environmental activist. In 2019, she co-founded Aponte, which is an organization grounded on geological principle with aim of bridging the gap between the sciences and society. Uh, one uh, last, a couple of last things before moving to the real question and uh, giving the possibility to the speaker to reply. I would like to thank all the speakers for uh, their uh, really interesting and inspiring presentation. I would like to thank AGI who is hosting this webinar and I would like to thank in particular Chris Keen and Lala Gonzalez. You have heard their voice uh, when there have been uh, some, uh, some problem and uh, we ask sorry for this uh, technical problem is our first experience and we really appreciate that you are still following this webinar. So I would like to thank all of you who follow this, uh, this webinar. And now I leave uh, the time for the, for the question and uh, during the question you will see here all our contacts and you have uh, the possibility of uh, uh, copying them. So I leave the, the space for Barbara to the speaker. Uh, Barbara, Barbara, we do not, we hear, do you. not hear you. Barbara, 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 Okay. Now we can hear you, Barbara. Oh. Hi. Anyone? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry for the technical problems. Thanks all the presenters for great presentations and all the people that are watching us online. The first question is uh, an anonymous question to Silvia and Giuseppe. What is the criteria to be the board member of ECST? I, I, Giuseppe. Uh, I, yeah, yes, I, 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 I can uh, answer. Uh, there is an email uh, and you and the uh, you can write to to the our ACST team uh, asking uh, to cooperate with them. We have uh, we have a board. Uh, you have seen all our members um, and uh, people who want to cooperate with them. Uh, they just send an email and uh, take contact with them and. Uh, and uh, open a discussion how to cooperate. Great, thank you very much. The second question is to Silvia from yes. Professor Suresh Kumar from India. Discrimination of human itself is not an ethical means. What is your opinion, Dr. Silvia? Uh, well, my opinion is that discriminations uh, as well as harassment or bullying have very serious ethical implications because these deplorable behaviors prevent individuals to act ethically. These behaviors compromise the climate of the workplace and so influence the manner in which uh, the, the victims uh, can act. As I said in my presentation, no ethical action is possible if we are under pressure or if we are suffering acts of uh, discrimination or harassment, if we are in any way not free to act. And fundamentally, basically, discrimination offend the dignity 
of the, the individual uh, that is one of the fundamental principles on which to base our respect for others and the, and the environment. So um, I think that uh, this kind of, of, uh, of issues are of utmost importance in geoethics. Perfect statement. Thank you very much. The next question is to Alexandra. It's an anonymous question. Are the educational resources of Goal are being used on higher education actually? Hello. Uh, so yes, I can say yes. Uh, I am using the educational resources on my PhD thesis, I am implementing them and I am seeing if the after the implementations, the notions of geoethics and sustainable development are changed. So uh, they are actually being used. I don't know if uh, they are used in uh, other countries. I use them uh, all. Uh, so I hope that uh, more people uh, start to use because geoethics education is really, really, really um, of utmost importance. And I think we should um, we should uh, take it into account on our curriculum, uh, mainly on geosciences curriculum and at higher education. Thank you very much. I have another one for you. Yeah. From Nicola Caredu. What, what do we have to do if decision makers don't listen to our suggestions? It's a good and tricky <laughs> question. Uh, so uh, if they don't listen to us, we have we have to try to <coughs> sorry to negotiate with them. Uh, because uh, I think that the opinion of the specialists in the areas are always welcomed when uh, geoethical issues or dilemmas are being discussed. So uh, maybe through dialogue is uh, the best way to change their opinion. I don't know what the what is the background I am talking here. But here in Portugal, we have to consult the geoscientists and we have to have the, their expertise to, to, for example, open a mining process or um, management of landslides and things like that. So uh, I cannot say anything more, but the dialogue between the government, between decision makers and the specialists. Thank you, I totally agree with you. So let's move on to the next question to Daniel. It's an anonymous question. Are not the scientists that involves in falsification of fossils, fake fossils punished by law? Is not there any penalty for such cheating scientists? What does the law says? Uh, thank you, Barbara. Um, this is a, a really uh, good question. Um, well, first, I would like to stress that usually uh, paleontologists, uh, they don't know that fossils are fake. And it's very difficult to prove that a uh, scientist has been uh, intentionally involved in fossil factory. So I think that there is no punish for this in terms of uh, law apart from the bad response of the scientific uh, community. Also, um, every category of collecting or sending is uh, subject to its own laws, and they can differ depending on where you live. Uh, I think that there are no specific laws for fossil, uh, fake fossils. Uh, in many countries in, in where the sites are protected by, for example, the UNESCO or local regulations, it's not allowed to trade with either real or fake uh, fossils. And this is punished by law. Even uh, it's dramatic because in some regions, some areas, uh, they include the, the death penalty. So the real problem here is that despite all these um, fake fossils, 
continue uh, on the black uh, market. Wow, thanks for answer. Seems like death penalty is really hard. On. Yes, it is. So let's move on to the next question to Sebastian. It's from Sander Muslo from Chile. Do the statistics include also the people that have to pay for access to water? Um, on this data, I have to check again. Uh, it should be the the data should include also the people that uh, have to pay for the excess of water. But I will come back to this if you write me just an email to to make sure. OK, I'll move on to the next question and you can answer in the end. OK. Mm -hmm. So the next question is also for you from Professor Suresh Kumar from India. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrongly. Uh, underdeveloped and developing countries are intensively polluting the water than the, develop, than the developed countries. Is this statement correct? If it is correct, how could it be resolved? Uh, to, to, to my knowledge, yeah, this is correct, uh, especially the developing countries uh, very heavily polluting their waters. Um, the three points that I uh, come up with in, in this short time was the, uh, one important thing is to share the knowledge from professionals uh, all over the world on how to, to, uh, how to take this uh, uh, problem into account. Um, and the second point would be to, to build up awareness as like we have seen with the the virtual water and the water footprint uh, initiatives, they, they try to, to make uh, consumers aware what they are consuming and to, to, so the consumers in the end can start to build pressure on the industry and uh, on the economy to, to go for best practice. And in the end, what is one of the most important things I think is to help in these countries to build up very strong institutions like uh, which is also the SDG uh, 16, so the Sustainable Development Goal 16, is to have also very strong institutions that uh, can help to um, to build up um, thresholds and to to build up laws to hold up the the environment. Thank you very much. So I'll move on to the next one, to Caesar. It's from Sando Muslo from Chile. He asked just no EIS, EIA. I don't know what it means. Uh, I, I, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. I have no idea. Uh, I think EIA. EIA. <laughs> Uh, probably, I, I think that uh, Sandor refers to uh, evaluation, um, um, environmental impact evaluation, something similar. Okay. Oh, it's environmental. Environmental impact assessment. Yes. 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 So, yes, exactly. yes. Okay. There are environmental impact assessments. Uh, the one that's uh, that was provided there did not uh, include what was needed. Uh, there are other norms such as ISO 31000, which is uh, the risk assessment, risk management ISO norm. And for example, that norm say you should develop risk tolerance threshold, except in that norm they don't explain how to do it. So from my experience, there is uh, there is some critical uh, missing component. Thank you. So yeah. uh, one more question for you, this time mm -hmm. an anonymous one. I think we have standard risk assessment methodology. Is not it applicable to all nation? Does it need harmonization with other countries? <laughs> So before before having harmonization, we need to understand what what we're talking about, and I'm not sure 
there is not that I know of, except that ISO 31000. There's a couple other, but it's there are norms for specific items. But even, for example, for tailings dam, there isn't a norm, and everybody's doing what they want and presenting what they want, which is my point of in the conclusion of having uh, the developer preparing their own risk assessment, which oftentimes leads to significant conundrum. Uh, there is no really generalized accepted risk assessment norm. Thank you, Caesar. Yes. So moving on to the last question to Linda. It's from Thunder Muslo from Chile. What can you say about degree of responsibility of scientists versus depreciate uh, decision power? Ah, so um, our job um, as scientists, if we are not in a decision making position, um, is to inform, to advise, to provide the most comprehensive picture that we can. Um, oftentimes we are asked for recommendations. And so we, when we do recommendations, we want to do the pros and the cons of those recommendations so that decision makers can make their decisions. Now in industry, you may be in a decision making mode, especially if if you own a resource, if your company owns a resource, you may have um, decision making power over how that resource is managed and how you extract it. And um, in that position as a resource, as a geoscientist, you are in a decision making mode and you can make conscientious geoethical decisions. Thank you, Linda, and thanks everyone that participated and sent some questions. So I'll just give the word back to Jonathan to give the final remarks to everyone. Thank you all. OK, uh, thank you, Bach, Bach for uh, this interesting, I would say, uh, final question session. Uh, I would like to thank again all the people who follow. We have a few dozen people who have been connected to this uh, to this webinar, and we really appreciate that many people uh, followed it and uh, remained with us up to this moment. As I said, we are recording this webinar, and uh, the registration will be provided. And if you want uh, uh, to ask for some uh, additional question, or uh, if you need something special, feel free to contact us. Uh, you have all our contacts, so don't uh, don't hesitate to do that. And if you want to contribute to the IAPG or to our uh, Rika Hair Scientist team, uh, if you want to publish something on our blog, or if you want to contribute more actively participating to the ECST um, team, uh, just uh, again, uh, feel free to contact us and we are happy to expand uh, to, to new people uh, and new members. A couple of last uh, things. We are, uh, I would say, always IPG is always happy to uh, involve more countries, and uh, you can see that there are many national contact points all around the world. So, uh, if you are not already uh, active in the association, you can check also in you, if in your country there is a, a national contact point. And uh, this year, the Geotics Day was related to the promise of Geotics. And uh, uh, there is a translation of the promise in 35 language. If uh, uh, you are uh, willing to help us and uh, translate uh, the promise in one of the language that is not there, that would be for sure really interesting. So we can uh, provide uh, the, the promise even in more languages. This is all from my side. I thank again uh, all the speakers. I thank uh, AGI who hosted uh, this, uh, this webinar. And uh, I say a goodbye and uh, hope to hear back uh, from you. And a greeting from all the speakers. If they want, they can all say goodbye to all of you. Thank you and the goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Right. Ciao. Thank, Thank you. you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.